thing. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about endangered languages and a variety of other issues uh, related to that. So uh, first and foremost, before we get started, I want to take a moment to do a land acknowledgement. Um, so we're going to pause to acknowledge that Santa Clara University sits on the land of the Alone and Muekma Alone people who trace their ancestry through the missions Dolores, Santa Clara, and San Jose. We remember their connection to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. Let's take a moment of silence to pay respect to their elders and to all the alone people of the past and present. Okay, um, I wanted to do the land acknowledgement. I think this is a great thing that Santa Clara is doing in an increasing number of presentations, but I wanted to do it especially uh, today um, because we're gonna be talking a little bit about different indigenous uh, languages. And while I will be focusing about like other parts of the world, I wanna recognize that these issues continue to impact real people in our real community um, here at Santa Clara as well. Um, so um, just taking that moment to acknowledge that is important to me. Um, so about me, I am Hallie Bodie. I work split in the Center for Global Law and Policy and the Center for the Sioka Center for uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I got my uh, master's in applied linguistics, which is kind of where a lot of my my interests draw from um, related to uh, the different issues that I'll be talking about today and, and a lot of the basis for um, some of the, the more like research oriented pieces of this. My bachelor's was in classics from Santa Clara. Um, and I think that that's where my interest in kind of the preservation of language, the preservation of culture um, comes from originally, uh, having studied seven years plus of Latin. Um, and then I speak advanced Latin and Japanese. Um, and uh, the kind of thing that I bring that's really unique for this topic is the translation of an Ainu textbook, which I'll be talking about a lot later. Um, I additionally, in the pandemic, have been bored lately. So I've built a website and I've been posting um, I've been and I'm working on some different blogs related to some different issues in sort of international education um, in issues like related to these types of topics like endangered language will probably come up at some point as well. Um, so for more information, check that out. Throughout this presentation, I've added a little bit of fun items. Uh, so you'll see emoji because emoji are pictographs that can um, actually are kind of like just demonstrating a, a language shift that's happening in English as well. So um, I had the fun of putting some of those in my presentation and these resemble our cat and our two chickens. Um, so have fun looking out for some of those during the presentation. All right, so um, this is just a general outline of what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, one, I'm gonna cover kind of the most spoken languages in the world. Uh, two, I will be providing an overview of a simplified language life cycle. So um, sort of what uh, happens in the life cycle of a language. Uh, three, we'll be talking about language change and lingua franca in focus. Uh, four, we'll be talking about the power and privilege in language. Um, I'll be also talking about why we why sh we should preserve languages, why that's important. I'll be using the Ainu language as an example and demonstrating some ways that you can uplift a language um, that may be disappearing. And lastly, um, I'll have a section for some questions and kind of some discussion. Um, I do want to point out that each of the topics that I'm covering here, this is a pretty simple overview on a lot of these topics. Uh, many of them are entire fields in themselves and could be a whole presentation uh, by themselves, uh, just as they are. So um, this is really just meant to kind of spark some interest and um, kind of connect you maybe with some uh, just a person on campus that's excited about these issues and um, be a place to, to sort of chat. And I'm happy to kind of continue these conversations um, after this. So uh, this is just kind of intended to showcase what the most spoken languages are in the world. Um, you can see the 12 most spoken languages in the world. And the reason that I have included this slide in this presentation 
um, is to demonstrate that power is partially in language is partially associated by a number of speakers. Um, so we can kind of test the, the, the health or even the um, success of a language typically through the number of current speakers that are, are kind of using that language or can um, communicate effectively in that language. Um, and you can see that English, of course, uh, which is kind of considered right now, um, though debated, but I'm going to just be, again, this is a kind of beginner's look at this, um, but English is kind of widely considered to be a lingua franca, um, and I'll be discussing a little bit more about that later on. And a lingua franca, just to, to step back for anyone who might need to know that, is a language that is kind of used uh, for the, the language of business, a language of medicine, um, different, different things related to that. All right. Um, so uh, this is a very, very simple overview of a language life cycle. So this is sort of the like very, very simple version of what happens in the life cycle of a language. Um, so the first step in a language is that a language is a pigeon. So um, essentially what this is, is this is a, a, a means of communication that comes completely out of necessity. So one of the coolest pigeons that I personally have encountered was uh, when I was working in the translation industry, um, we, we did a major case on uh, automobiles and uh, like an automobile manufacturing uh, company, kind of like a, like a Toyota or a Nissan or something like that, basically um, had its factories in both China and Japan. And they created a system like themselves within this one company of what was basically what could be considered a pigeon because they would use documents. And if you were on the Chinese side, you could read them from the Chinese side. And if you were on the Japanese side, you could read them from the Japanese side without knowing the other language. Um, and so they, they sort of, um, so you, you usually, when you see a pigeon, you can kind of still see a lot of remnants of the, the, the kind of languages that are um, the, the sort of languages that they're coming from um, and, and, it really becomes a Creole the next stage when it's something that's like, like starts to be spoken by children essentially, or, or starts to be um, kind of utilized by children. They start applying real grammatical rules to the language and kind of creating a grammar. Um, this is something that is uh, like lost by us as adults. Um, we lose sort of the ability to do this, but um, children sort of start applying different, um, are able to apply different uh, like kind of, um, abilities to that particular language and, and they make it into a real, real grammar essentially. Um, so that's when you start to see a Creole. Um, the next stage is kind of where you start to get the spread. Um, if you get really a lot of success, maybe you get a ling lingua franca, um, but you really sort of start to see like kind of it become a language. There's a little bit of debate in, in some of these categories. I've made them a, a hard category in here, which isn't exactly accurate. So again, going back to what I said earlier about how um, sort of each of these slides could be possibly a whole whole conversation in and of itself, but this is just intended to be sort of an introduction. So you kind of see that development, right? Um, and then we get to kind of some of these other stages where you start to have language change. And, and this is, I mean, this is common, you know, like if anybody who's read Shakespeare, for example, um, can see that we've had language change, right, in English. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but some of the things that might be associated with change sometimes can also be disappearance, right? Because you can, might, might see the lead up of a, another language that's taken over. And again, we'll be talking about that later on. Um, and then eventually uh, when sort of all the living speakers die off um, of the language, uh, it's considered to be a language that has officially died. And some examples of that might be like Latin or ancient Greek, uh, for example, where there's really very, very limited um, speakers and the speakers that, that use it today are not using it as their first language at all. Um, and that's kind of when you kind of consider a language to be uh, pretty much gone. So um, first and foremost, the first thing I wanna say is that language change isn't always bad. So language change can happen for a variety of reasons. Um, so one of the examples that I am really excited about is the move towards a singular they. Um, so in our, our country um, in the last, like I would say five to 10 years, there's been a move away from uh, terms like you guys uh, towards a move to like you all or folks um, to be a little bit more gender inclusive. So language change can actually be a good thing or can can be something that that promotes um, inclusivity. Additionally, another kind of major recent language change that we've seen has been uh, the 
the the internet actually has caused a lot of that um and things like text speak so text speak came originally from character limits and text messages which every single person currently in here is old enough to remember this um but i know that i've talked to some students where they're they're kind of surprised by this um as being the origin of of the language um but uh basically because of the character limits of the like 160 characters you had people moving towards uh you know away from um kind of uh, like long, long words to, to writing, just sort of shorthand um, and using emojis maybe, which I've added a pictographical element, as I mentioned earlier, um, to, to, the, to, to the English that was formerly not there. Um, some examples of this, of course, are LOL, um, letter Y instead of the word Y, um, things like that. So it's not always a bad thing. And I think that that's important to mention um, because I think that frequently, in the topic of endangered languages, um, language change is treated as kind of universally bad um, when it, it may not always be. Additionally, um, I wanna also kind of a similar sort of topic is I, I wanna touch on how lingua francas aren't always bad. So again, the lingua franca is a little, little, the language that's kind of typically associated with a language for business or a language where if you know that language, you, it's like the language that kind of rules them all potentially. Um, there's a lot of negatives associated with lingua francas and, and we'll sort of discuss some of the, the power and privilege pieces in a little bit, but um, there is a big benefit of them, right? And that primary benefit is communication. So companies are increasingly diverse. Let's say that you've got four workers on some uh, global team. They're all working together. One worker's native language is Mandarin. One might be Arabic. One is Russian and one is Spanish. All of these were those 12 most commonly spoken languages uh, or come from that 12, that list of 12 most commonly spoken languages that I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is a very likely situation in a global company. Uh, for this team to be able to all speak their native language, each speaker would have to know four languages, right? They would have to know their own language plus the, the three other languages. So this would require a pretty substantial amount of academic investment since these languages are not like related, right? Uh, Spanish is a romance language versus like Mandarin where they'd have to know all those characters and everything else. So um, this is a, a pretty unlikely scenario that, that people would be able to speak all these languages. There are some exceptions. Um, we see that in Europe where, uh, like you've got a lot of the romance languages, um, all close together. So you do, you do see some people that can speak the language of every other member of their team, even in a global context. But, um, this is pretty, like, I, I think this is a, a pretty unrealistic expectation for most companies, uh, for, for easy communication basically. And so, while none of these speakers may speak native English, they could all communicate by the use of um, English. So this is something that we see quite frequently that's interesting is that the majority of people that are speaking English to each other, um, according to the research, I think it's uh, a pretty high figure um, are not actually native speakers of English uh, when they're communicating, which is interesting. Um, so uh, just jumping back and, and kind of making that uh, final point. So basically communication is, is the biggest benefit of, of a lingua franca. On the flip side, uh, there's a lot of power and privilege associated with language. So lingua francas or languages associated typically with economic power can and do wipe out other languages. Um, so varieties within a language are also associated with power and privilege. And we see this in English. Um, the uh, black vernacular, for example, of English is typically um, not considered to be as powerful as um, the uh, as what is traditionally associated with like white English. Um, so, basically, uh, some of the ways that you can identify power and privilege in language, uh, just in terms of the the wider languages, and then even potentially within vernaculars, could be what languages are taught and used in schools or are associated with academic power. Um, so right now in Mongolia, this is a big debate uh, because there's a there's a push by the government to offer um, less bilingual education and more um, education in like Mandarin, essentially. And so um, kind of seeing seeing like the, the, the languages that are taught in schools can, can kind of be associated with uh, power potentially. What languages are taught and used in business or are associated with um, economic power in that way? Um, so there's a variety of opinions on whether or not Mandarin will become a lingua franca because of the, the economic power in China. Um, I think that widely, of course, uh, English is seen as, as a, a powerful language because of the use in business and the, the use by a variety of different companies. Um, 
what languages are used by government or governing forces. So is your constitution, for example, in a particular language? Is um, some other form of documentation in a particular language? I mentioned earlier medicine as well, which is kind of tied a little bit to this. Um, so you sometimes can see, you know, like if there's a particular language that's associated with medicine, um, what's neat about that that industry is I think medical interpretation has grown so substantially that, that that's part of why it didn't include it on this list. Um, and, and that's a nice thing that's happened in the US in, in recent years as well, but continues to kind of be a challenge um, or, or a demonstration of, of the power of, of certain languages around the world. What media is produced first in one language? Uh, what languages then does it have to be translated into? So that can be something, um, particularly when looking at endangered languages within a particular context. Um, so if if all media is only produced in one language, and then if like it may be translated into another, um, that can be a symbol of um, certain power in a particular language or a shift uh, potentially. And then there's a misconception as well, but I, I think that it's it's worth pointing out from a research standpoint of the idea that there might be languages that families might worry about their children using. Um, and so this this has this has partially led off to the the this has led to the dying off of a lot of languages. Um, and so that's sort of why I bring it up, but it's a huge misconception. It's actually really good for the brains of children and adults to, to be bi bilingual. There's a lot of benefits um, neuro neurologically to bilingualism. So children are not gonna be harmed by learning more than one language. Um, but I'm, I bring this up because I think that it can, it, it can be an identifier of power, um, even if it's incorrect, um, it can be an identifier of power in, in a language. Um, a question to ask yourself uh, for the second languages that you might be studying or might know um, is, uh, are certain varieties considered more powerful than others? So I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, Black English is, is like, there's, there's a big change on here. And actually the link that I've put there um, has some of the, the shifts that have happened and sort of how there's a, a growing push uh, for more acceptance academically as well as in the classroom, um, which is really exciting. But uh, that that kind of is a variety that is typically not as um, positively viewed in the U.S. Um, and so that's that's kind of I I put this question in, and I will say there is I have yet to encounter a language that there is not a variety that is considered more powerful than another. Um, a big example of this is that in the U.S., uh, typically uh, where I grew up, the um, majority of speakers of Spanish that were local were from a Latin American context, but in school, um, the Spanish uh, from Spain was what was taught. So uh, you can see kind of, I, I like, I, I really do not know of a single language that has, uh, a, that does not have a, a, a variety of it, at least that is uh, deemed, quote unquote, lesser um, than another variety. Uh, so even within a language, basically, you can identify power and privilege uh, through the, the particular varieties that may have more power. All right, um, so why is language preservation important? Um, so I obviously am biased, I'm a classics major. Um, I love language, I love uh, culture as well. Um, so there's no doubt in my mind that um, the preservation of language is important. I consider it to be a big piece of our history as humans, um, a big part of the like human culture. Um, and uh, UNESCO actually also agrees. So they did a they do a report um, every couple of years. And last the most recent one I could find on the web was 2011's report. But basically, in that report, they say that languages are the vehicles of our cultures, collective memory, and values. They're an essential component of our identities and a building block of our diversity and living heritage. And yet about half of some 6,000 languages spoken today are in danger of disappearing. So um, that's why it's important because they're in danger of disappearing and languages are a piece of our culture as, and, and our identities and a building block to our diversity. Oh, uh, just one more thing on that quickly. Uh, UNESCO also has a map on their website where you can kind of see uh, where languages are disappearing and they also kind of track the number of speakers of um, language of all languages basically so um, that's something that's neat to see and every once in a while they'll put out a report on um, kind of the success of different initiatives to, to, to save a language, um, so that's always fun to, to look out for um, and see as well. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about my own experience uh, with uh, Japan and with the Ainu language. Um, so uh, just uh, on the map, you can see uh, Sapporo is labeled um, in Japan. I'm going to try. I'm going to try the annotate feature for a second here. Um, so basically, the Ainu uh, are located here, and then they're also located in Russia. Um, so the, the Ainu are an indigenous population that um, kind of has a variety of different subgroups that have been split across the two countries. Um, and that's uh, that split happened as a result of some of the, the like endings of, um, I believe it was World War II, basically. I'm not, I will admit here, I'm not as familiar with the Russia side. Um, a lot of my knowledge comes from the Japan side. Um, I do not believe that Ainu language is spoken anymore in um, Russia at Sakhalin, um, but it is spoken still in, in Japan. The official count of um, Ainu people in Japan is, is 25,000. Unofficial counts are, are much, much higher than that. Um, and I've, I've seen them actually go kind of far beyond 200,000. Um, for me, I learned about like, I, I think that one of the pieces that I think is so important about this is, is actually how I came to learn um, about the Ainu. I studied abroad in Tokyo, which is down here. And of course, it's pretty far from um, where the Ainu are located, like primarily located in Japan. Um, but I still would have thought that I would have learned about this when I was studying abroad there. Um, and I think that that's, I, th I think that the fact that that didn't happen, I think shows kind of something that's, that's interesting, um, to me. And I, I found out about the, the Ainu and about their language during, um, a class that I took when I came back to Santa Clara, where they were mentioned in about three sentences, um, all of the different indigenous groups, and there are other indigenous groups in Japan as well, um, were mentioned in about three se sentences in a textbook in um, a Japanese culture class, uh, which was kind of interesting, um, just from a standpoint of um, sort of the invisibility of indigenous people, um, and a little bit sad to me, actually. So I think that that's, that is part of what kind of drew my interest and, and drew me to, to being interested in the Ainu and the Ainu language. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of uplifting a language. And there are two things that I want to highlight, one of which I will be talking about. And, and that's this one down here um, with the, the translating textbooks. Um, so uplifting, lifting languages and their speakers. Uh, so basically, I think the first thing you can do is combat misinformation. So like I said, Japan had always been presented to me as a homogenous country, right? Um, and that's just objectively not true. Um, and so I think that being able to combat this kind of misinformation is important for uplifting languages and their speakers. You can share and follow social media that's in the language. So for example, I have followed um, the iNew radio channel sometimes. Um, I'll listen to that. Uh, is the language written? So that can be uh, one thing to, to kind of find out. Uh, a lot of a lot of indigenous languages are um, primarily oral languages, uh, which can kind of limit their ability to be preserved um, or to be protected. Uh, so uh, for I knew in particular, they used uh, the Japanese foreign alphabet, and um, they also used the Roman alphabet uh, to kind of um, help in the preservation of it. Um, but basically something, if you're interested in this and have a good ear is potentially supporting indigenous linguists, linguists in their creation of their alphabet or in the utilization of the international phonetic alphabet to uh, create an alphabet. Uh, there's also the opportunity to learn an indigenous language via du Duolingo. This is something I'll talk a little bit more about. You can translate tweets into and from the language. You can translate poetry or other cultural works from the language. Uh, you can make a website, blogs, videos, et cetera, sort of addressing the language um, or kind of uh, demonstrating information about the language. Um, for students, they could pursue a Fulbright after graduation to research a language potentially. Um, I'll mention more about the textbook piece in a bit, but just largely advocating for indigenous languages and peoples to be recognized by governments also is important. Um, and so a lot of these go back to the, the things that I had mentioned of what's kind of associated with power and privilege in a language. So if we go back to here, you'll see a lot of the, the things that I was trying to address and, and sort of the various ideas come from sort of trying to add basically power back into a particular language. Um, 
Remember, of course, for any of these activities, the focus should be on the indigenous voices and providing power back to those voices and to the users of that language, just thus prioritizing the translation of materials from that language that are already existence or already in existence um, or sharing and preserving the cultural artifacts is most important. So basically um, making sure that you're giving them a chance to speak their stories essentially. Um, okay, so I want to touch on Duolingo for a second. So in 2018 for Indigenous Peoples Day, Duolingo added Native Hawaiian and Navajo to their offerings. Um, so this is something that's pretty cool. Um, I think that there are a lot of other folks that are getting excited about language preservation um, that have the ability to really do a lot of work in that area. So if you're interested in, um, if you don't like know an existing language or and, and just want like to do something that's less ex in intensive perhaps like I think even just starting with taking the time to to learn a little bit more of the grammar of an indigenous language could could be useful for that. Um, so now I'm going to talk about my textbook experience. So I mentioned earlier that I learned a lot about the Ainu people um, and about their language. Um, so basically I, I kind of got this interest and I decided that I wanted to I, I value the educational experience. I think that that's just where I believe that in order to really preserve a language, you have to have people speaking it. And in order to get people to speak it, they have to be able to learn it, right? Um, so that's part of why I highlighted the Duolingo um, example and also why I chose to translate a textbook. Um, so I think that the, the textbook that I found came from a um, Japanese, uh, slash and, and then specifically like an organization in Japan that is um, to that works on preservation of Ainu culture and they had basically taken for each of the varieties of Ainu they had created a series of one to three beginner to intermediate textbooks um, and so I picked one of the textbooks and basically uh, just sat down and translated it um, and, and just sort of worked on um, translating the Japanese portions that were in Japanese, uh, translating the portions of Ainu that were in Ainu, and um, sort of trying to make it possible for somebody that wanted to learn Ainu to take that that came from an English language background to take their um, uh, to take the English portions that I had written and then learn the Ainu directly rather than having to know Japanese to be able to access the material. Um, so at the time when I did this, there was basically nothing in English and I knew. So there was a grammar, there was like a, like, it wasn't even like a grammar book. It was like a grammar, um, encyclopedia, I guess is basically how I would describe it, uh, from like 1980, uh, that had been created by, I think it was a Swedish researcher, um, that had like translated some book in Swedish to English essentially and it was not useful at all I could I like I I literally don't think that unless you had a true background in linguistics you like a master's I even struggled like with understanding and I was like this is not useful at all for somebody that wants to truly learn the language um there was uh basically every other resource that I was able to find was a Japanese resource so I used like a Japanese dictionary to translate some of the portions that I didn't understand where the the textbook hadn't been as clear to me um, and so essentially what I was trying to do was basically putting, by putting the textbook into English, which is a lingua franca, which is one of the, like the, you know, the largest, most spoken language in the world. Um, I was trying to increase the uh, visibility of Ainu and trying to increase the access to being able to learn it, um, essentially. So I found that to be, I think that this is a nice, I find this to be a useful way because again, I, I think that the the piece that resonates with me is the fact that you have to be able to learn a language if you want it to, to survive. Um, and so I think though that there's a lot of other ways again to get to get into preservation, um, going back to the long list that, that I had of some ideas. Um, one misconception that I just wanna say is while you do need to have some language, like some knowledge of the language that you would be translating from, um, you don't have to be a perfect speaker to do this. My Japanese is far from perfect. Um, it will take you a little bit longer if you're not a perfect speaker, um, but it is possible. Uh, I found it to be a very rewarding challenge personally um, because uh, it was an actual challenge for me um, with a lot of things that are out there. Uh, you can kind of cheat essentially. Um, I meant the, the reason that I mentioned all the lack of existing English materials is like, there's no way to cheat essentially. 
Um, but it also, it was a feasible challenge. So it wasn't so, so challenging to translate a beginner's textbook that it was like impossible. Um, so I enjoyed it. Uh, there's also a lot of supports that you can find on the web. You can find like different forums and whatnot that will always sort of support you if you do hit a real roadblock. Um, or worse comes to worse, you can ask like a professor or something like that um, if you've hit a, a sort of a roadblock. Uh, for me, I felt like it was a, like I felt like it was the truest showing that I had mastered basic Japanese because I like it was a it was a basic I knew textbook written through learning of basic Japanese. So in order to to translate it, I had to really have a mastery of that. I also found it to be a solidification of grammar and kind of like learning grammar concepts specifically through Japanese, um, which I had not done before. I'd never studied. I had never studied a third language through my second language basically before. So that was something that was really interesting for me. Um, and then lastly, for me, it, it led to a much broader knowledge of Asia as a region. I did not know about Sakhalin Island at all. Um, and I, I still don't know as much about the Russia side um, as I do about the Japan side, but I, I learned a little bit about that. And I learned about the indigenous stories of the Ainu. Um, and some of the, cause it's, they had like cultural material basically about it that, that um, sort of described their, their culture. And so that was, that was really cool. Cause in a textbook, right, you get songs, like you get um, all kinds of different things as like the activities. And so I got to really, I, I felt like I really got to learn about the culture from the standpoint of, of the Ainu since they had created the textbook to um, share that with people that were Japanese that might want to learn it or with um, Ainu descendants that um, may not really have a strong of a connection to their culture. All right, so some final thoughts. I just wanna put one more time that this is really rewarding. Um, and then kind of going back to how I started with our, um, I, I started with the land acknowledgement for Santa Clara. Um, so I just wanna again reiterate that the US is not immune from these issues and from the invisibility of our indigenous peoples basically. Um, all right, so that's my talk portion. I'm gonna turn off the recording at this point um, and then I'll open it up for a conversation.